Hello, welcome to Live Art TV. My name is Thomas Boskett, and we're here to look at the art of Edeo Pantaleoni today. Uh, I look forward to taking on a little bit of a journey around his works. We're going to look at about 11 different paintings, um, but you can go online to livearttv.com and see all 55 of his works that are in the collection. Uh, you can also call us at any point if you have any questions. We're at 855-983-5483. You can also, obviously, connect with us streaming live on Roku, Android, Apple, Amazon Fire Stick, and YouTube. Uh, we're going to look up here. Let's take a look at some pieces earlier on in Ideo's career. Ideo is an Italian artist. Um, he's going to span a pretty wide range of experiences. You're going to see stuff from the, tw the, well, the 40s, 50s, 60s, all the way up to the 80s. So what was going on with him? He was born in 1904 in the province of Verona. And he studied at different schools, Dosa Dosi in Ferrara. He studied in Bologna. And then late in his life, he studied in Milan. Not too late, but, well, or pretty early on actually, but all the way through to later, but he worked in Milan. He was actually studying there when he was 19 years old. He was a young man and had already had a great deal of artistic experience had seen a lot of different places, a lot of different styles, and was then in the epicenter of art. You can see that as you move through here, you'll see different things that he explored that are, I would say, a range of experiences. But what's striking to me is that all of those experiences come back to some very solid content, which is the concrete art movement and the informal art movement. The concrete art movement was something that he was a founder of in Italy. It was called the Movimento, uh, Movimento Arte Concreta. Uh, it's abbreviated MAC, and in 1954 he did quite a bit with this world, uh, this style, and it basically breaks down into something of abstraction. If you come over here just a little bit, you'll see the, a glance at one that we're going to talk about in a minute. This is an epitome of art concrete, which is geometrical abstraction. Uh, very, what, what, the reason it was called concrete is that it has very concrete uh, artistic elements to it, like shape and line. And if you're wondering what this is, it's a cast. I broke my arms, so just bear with me if you see it. You can actually tell me the story of your broken arms. It's very concrete itself, too. Um, this is the, the concrete you see all through this image. You actually see brush marks and paint that is very physical. And if we go, we're going to zoom through this a little bit, but we're going to start off speaking more extensively about his, his earlier works. But this piece, you see all these marks and brush marks. This is all concrete. It just means concrete, as opposed to something that we consider more illusionistic. Illusionistic is when the marks that you make uh, indicate something like flesh or an eye, but they aren't necessarily the paint itself. Here you have the paint itself telling you what it's about. And in something like this, you see um, uh, you know, a very strong brush mark that says, like, uh, you know, I'm here, and there's no question about it. I'm a red mark, I'm a blue mark, but I'm not uh, a thing, like, necessarily like a, a, the, the edge of an apple or the glint in someone's eye or the shine in a lover's smile. You know, they're very, they are what they are. They are paint. So let's zoom over here a little bit and take a look at some of these pieces. These two pieces, again, by Adeo Pantaleoni, this piece in 1957, and... And it's a view of boats in Venice. Um, you'll see if you, if you come across here, this large boat is sort of sitting in the background. The littler boats are sitting up front, and they kind of connect to this very large sandy sort of soil area. They're embedded in it. They're quite dense and kind of contained. Uh, if you back up, you can kind of float all through this distant landscape, which becomes very pale and sort of soft. It's almost like a dream into the sky that is uh, very loosely painted. Now, I said that his work was con uh, from the concrete movement, but this is before that phase. And this is when he was actually in a place where I think he was sort of experimenting with those ideas of art having a very physical component that you can feel in your body. And so if you look at this, although it's alluding to a scene of boats and whatnot, you can really feel the presence of this place. The water here, although very similar to the sky, is also very different. It's superficially similar, but if you look closely, the water is soft. The water is smooth. The water is basically what water should be, uh, alive and flickering and moving. Whereas if you, and, and 
solid. If you look at the water, although it's smooth and soft, it's also solid. You feel it laying here. There's some gray marks in here that are actually holding it down. If you come up above a little bit, you start to see the sky. The sky is just floating and flickering, and it feels like clouds and life and air. And there's actually some really um, fluffy sort of brush marks that don't lay flat like the water. They actually stir it up quite a bit. You see all through here. You're sort of jumping around. So at this point in his life, this is 1957, He's probably looking like he's thinking about those physical things, but he's still representing the physical world. Um, so it's expressive, but it's, it's still uh, realistic and holding on to that idea that something is um, what you see uh, more than what you feel and experience. You, you, you see these boats. You feel Venice. Um, and it, this is an outskirts of Venice a bit. It's not the main city. This is actually a, a, at a distance. And I wonder if any of you have ever been there. If you've been there, I'd like you to give me a call. We're at 855-983-5483. And my name is Thomas Boskett. I look forward to hearing from you. If you have any questions, uh, you can always call that number, but you can also go to livearttv.com. You can find us on Live Art TV. That's who we are. And livearttv.com is our website. You can tune in there, take a look around, and see the whole collection. Today we're going to look at 11 works by Adeo Pantaleone. You can also look at the rest of the collection, which is 55 works by Adeo, online. Um, if we jump up here a bit, let's come up to this piece. This is a beautiful piece. This piece of the fish. This is still life with fish. It's very early on in his career. In 1946, he signed it right down here, Adeo Pantaleone. It's 27 and a half inches high, uh, wide. Sorry, uh, I'm sorry, wide. 27 and a half inches by 19 and a half inches. It's oil on canvas. And if you're visiting us from a European audience, this is 50 by 70 centimeters. This work of art is $8,600. And it's a beautiful still life of... Uh, two fish, I think bass, and you can see that one looks like it's been dried, the other is still kind of covered in olive oil and ready to be cooked. There's some beautiful garlics here, and I wish you could see these up close. There's some beautiful brush marks uh, and life in here. There's a green and a violet uh, with an orange sort of warm green kind of wrapped around it, and you won't believe the the quality of the strokes in here. I bet you actually we're close enough. Yeah, we are. You can actually see everything that's going on here. It's, it's wrapping these garlics. Garlic being, you know, a bulbous sort of three-dimensional form. You can see the brush marks are actually wrapped around that containing these garlics. If you come over this way, you'll see uh, this bulb is actually a little bit different than the last one. It's a little bit um, softer, sort of gentler marks as it wraps around. It's a little more discreet. It's purple, it's got uh, turquoises in it. These are all secondary colors. Again, they're colors that are considered a little more complex and a little more settling. They're not so, um, uh, what would you say, uh, aggressive as a, as a primary color, a red, yellow, or blue. They're much more subtle and kind of quiet. Uh, if you enlarge out to the whole picture, you start to see this plate. It's holding the whole thing together. There's this wonderful, it's almost flat, uh, the way it sits up on the surface, so it presents the fish to us. And this painting is very comforting to me. It's, it's very well contained. The, there's this platter that holds itself as it mimics the frame, and you see how the frame and the platter sort of mimic each other. They hold this space very concretely. If you look at the other garlics and things, they're sort of dancing around and, and giving a little life to the bottom, but then you have this great anchor of two lemons uh, on the side. So this painting... Uh, overall is well contained but full of quite a bit of life on the interior now i wonder what was he thinking again where, where does he go with this um this is early in his life he's very interested in experiences that we have and how do we record those experiences how do we actually paint something that is about what we're experiencing and if i look at this this isn't just about him painting a still life this is about him painting a piece of his life. He's eating lunch, potentially. Many of us have eaten lunch. This is an experience that we have generally um, like a celebration of life. You know, you sit down at the table and you have a little meal. Um, what this is is almost there's the fish, there's the lemons, there's the garlic. It feels like the beginning of the meal. You know, he's thinking about the celebration of making this meal, what's involved and getting excited about it. And you can see in the fish and stuff that he's... He's really appreciating all the delicacies and the, the nuances of what's going to happen here. You know, look at this wonderful 
jumpy little brush stroke and this quirky head that he's got going on. That's a lot of activity, and I think, what does that speak to? Sort of the, the lusciousness of life, the, the, the scariness of life at times, but it's, it's exciting. You know, and he's taking me on a journey all the way through this fish, all the way back over here to these yellow strokes that finish in this, in this beautiful green. I'm sorry, purple strokes finishing this beautiful yellow green. Um, this is, this is a, a strong piece in that it's so well contained, you know. It um, kind of wraps around, wraps around, and then you'll notice right here at the top of the plate, the pink sort of holds this whole bottom section together. So then what is this? Could be the sky, but it also could just be a quiet space that sort of rests up there in the distance and sort of calms down. Very, very gentle, you know? Look at these curves. Look how gentle these curves are up here. How easy he's taking you on a journey through this painting. As opposed to what happens in the bottom, he's giving you a lot more life and activity. He's giving you a lot more to look at and think about and kind of dance with. Um, this painting is again, Still Life with Fish. It's from 1946. Early in his career, this artist, Edeo Pantaleoni, was interested in concrete art, uh, the art which kind of records our very visceral experiences. And so that's what he was doing here. He was taking us into something that's uh, a record of our experiences of preparing a meal. And I think we all understand that. I think uh, if you think you know, every painting of a meal is the same. We're wrong, right? Every meal is different. So you think, why was this meal special? This meal has a very, um, I have to say it has a, a, a kind of a stereotypical soft, like a, an innocence or a baby to it. It's got a pink and a blue to it. It feels like a, 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 a young sort of youthful background. I think Then why did he put these colors in in the front that are much stronger? Um, it's, I guess, as we mature, as we age, we sort of pull ourselves together and, and you get these these densities that you see in here, but they're in a, a field of youth and simplicity in the background. Um, I think for me, if you see this piece live, you'll, you'll realize that it's a very delicate creature. It's, it's complex, but very soft. And I wanna go over here. Let's point down here and kind of zoom around and come over here to a giant piece. Uh, this is an interesting piece, uh, very complicated uh, compared to the last two we were looking at. Let me, let me find my notes here because I, this is a, a piece to talk about for a bit. I don't know. Uh, where did it go? Nope. <laughs> it's about, what, 30-something inches wide. It's about 46 inches high. Here we go, here we go. It's 31 inches. 31 inches wide and 39 inches high. It's 80 by 100 centimeters. This painting is called Jewels in Ice. It was made in 1982, and it's $8,600. Jewels in Ice. What was Ideo Pantaleoni doing here? What was he thinking about that he wanted to talk to us? All right, let's take a look together. Come on down here. These are the jewels, obviously. They're embedded in this brick of ice. But then what is all this? What is all this green? What is the red up there? Whoop, 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 whoop. Let's go up, see what's up here. This is the red. You think, what is he doing with all of this? And I have to pause for a minute because if I'm gonna get your input, I need you to know where to reach us. Look at the number on the screen. It's 855-983-5483. We are at livearttv.com. And I want you to give me a ring. My name is Thomas Boskett. I am a professor of art but I'm also um, a lover of what it means to record our experiences in life and make something we call art or an artifact. I want you, as a lover of art, to share your experiences and what you're excited about. Think about the things that have moved you in your life. And when you see something like this, think about what does this image actually talk about to you? It could be, it doesn't have to be jewels and ice, right? It could be a floral bouquet at your wedding. It could be something that you remember thinking, ah, that was a really crystal clear moment in my life. It could be a cold winter night when you're outside and, and you feel the crisp, crisp uh, ice of the snow. And then you think of that crunching under your boots. And maybe you have an early memory of snow, something that brings back a sensation of being uh, a, you know, a young person playing in the cold and loving the cold rather than feeling absolutely killed by it as I do nowadays because it's been in the teens here and we're all dying. But uh, this painting, I think, is a celebration of a lot of this artist's history. Adeo Pantaleoni is well known 
uh, in the European world for establishing the concrete art movement and the art informal. Informal, informale in Italian, informal in our world in the West. Uh, what he's doing here is he broke things down to be very, very clear geometries, very clear brush marks. And these brush marks and geometries were what we consider informal because they, they record a piece of our lives that we can't really put words on right away. Like we can say this is, uh, alludes to jewels and ice or, or a snowy night or whatever, but more so it's an experience of flickering abstraction. It's a flickering color, light, shape. Look how quiet it gets down here. Look at this, look at this moment down here where it almost looks like there's nothing happening. It gets so quiet and you can ease your mind into that and sort of rest a little bit. If you're sitting at home and you're resting for a minute, you can probably appreciate these, these shapes. But then if you come up into this image and you open up a little bit, back out, you can see this whole image and you think, what is it if we try, it's almost difficult to talk at the same time about something that doesn't have a, a, a literal noun attached to it like a, a ice or an object. But if you just try to experience it, it's more like music. And listen to this painting for a minute. Listen to it in your ear and think, what do I hear? And I hear this clattering and I hear um, almost like crystal bells or something like ding, 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 ding. You know, you can hear this thing in your head and you think, what does that actually relate to in my life? And for me, it's something of like, uh, how my brain works or how I'd be thinking about something. Um, and, I, and, and I always think that uh, with this much activity, you know, happening all through something like this, there's got to be a lot of, of excitement and a lot of energy. Um, it reminds me of my sister. My sister actually tends to be pretty energetic and she's pretty alive. And a piece like this uh, clearly speaks to that type of youthful energy, uh, maybe of a, a young woman and what she's thinking about, you can actually see somebody right here, almost a person forming right here. There's a being in an arm doing something. It looks like they're almost golfing <laughs> in the middle of an ice painting. It doesn't make a lot of sense, but it might be what's happening, or it might be our wish in the middle of the ice that we get into something that we can enjoy. But this youth and the, the breakdown of a work, I think, that's considered um, informal, meaning, again, that it touches those abstract elements, you know, it pulls together. So I look at these pieces where this pulls together, like all through here and up through here, and he's anchoring things so that he can swing these other pieces off of that, like, a, like a, a petals of a, of, a, of a flower or something, where you're able to just ride on the surface of this and scoot along and feel the expressiveness of it. This painting, uh, again, is Jewels and Ice. It's $8,600. It is oil on canvas. It is 31 by 39 inches. For a European audience, that would be 80 by 100 centimeters. Uh, this is actually a period in the artist's life, and he's, 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 this is 1982, and he was born in 1904. Uh, so we're looking at, what, 78 years? He's 78 years old. Is that right? Is that the math right on that? Huh. 82 minus 4, 78. Yep, that's where we are. So he's 78 years old. This is the culmination of his life. This is all of the pieces of him that coming together in my mind. Um, and what are those pieces? He did gestural abstractive pieces. He did concrete art pieces, which are all about abstraction being concrete. He did informal pieces, which are about expressing the emotion that's in us. And if you look around, you start seeing other pieces that inform these worlds. This is clearly the gestural abstraction where he's moving around in this piece and it's very lively. You can see the red, there's blood red all through it turning into a fire red in the middle. The fire red is surrounded by blackness which accentuates the red even more. Uh, there's a thing called simultaneous contrast in art where the darker it is, the lighter something else will appear and vice versa, the lighter something is, the darker something will appear. So they flicker off of each other and you have this strange dark green moving through there that's almost equivalent to the black, but it's subtly offset. And then it comes into these background, uh, they're not actually white white, they're kind of a red white or a green white depending on where you catch them. But there's these very subtle sort of flickerings in the background in his work. Now, this piece, let me take you inside it a little bit. Um, let's see if I can grab it. Hold on a second. Do, do, do. Here we are. This is, it's called Ribbons. This is from 1968. It's 19 and a half inches by 23 and a half inches. It's number six if you're giving us a ring uh, at 855-983-5483. Uh, you can go to livearttv.com as well, see this work. Now this piece, Ribbons, uh, it's 
I was talking about innocence earlier, and this isn't exactly uh, innocence, but it's a, a um, it's like discovering maturity. It's like finding yourself in something. So there's these very heavy moments that hold this together. But then it's sort of floating above these strong bars. And it reminds me, it reminds me like this would be a, a young woman's face uh, as she maybe aged or matured. And then you, she has some knowledge and wisdom of what's going on. Although there's still the youthful energy, you know? You, never, you hear people say they never feel their age. I never feel my age. And you say, like, no, I'm not, I may be 50, but I feel like I'm 12. And this painting reminds me of this notion that there's a very, very mature person who's grown up and has wisdom in them, but they still remember what it is to be young and to have that youthful quality, that life to you. So it's, it's not done, you know? It's got a lot going on. The painting is done, but the experience is not done. The person wants to live. They want to have a good time and, uh, and ride that wave. You know, there's some beautiful gestural marks in this where the painting is just riding. And actually, this is a nice frame on it. This is a, 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 like a sterling silver frame uh, that complements the, the grays and the warmth in here. If, if you mix these two colors together, actually, you get kind of a gray quality that's akin to what's happening out here if it was lighter. Uh, it actually is nice. A very, very nice uh, container for this painting. Uh, the painting also, like I said earlier, he's dealing with the concrete movement. You hear me saying that over and over and over. That's such a big part of what he was about, and I think we have to contrast against that, that against what it really means, what, what its opposite is. So concrete is a brush mark, is abstract, and it is what it is is what it is. A black mark is a black mark, right? It doesn't represent anything but the mark that it is. Whereas when we allude to something, like we put a stroke down and it actually looks like a piece of fruit or a boat or a hand, that's not concrete. That's illusionistic, or they'll refer to it as plastic. Uh, it doesn't mean plastic, literally. It just means that it has flexibility and it sort of moves in our mind. Whereas something like this doesn't move in our mind as much. A black stroke is a black stroke. Now, what does that do for us, or why is that good for us? As somebody who appreciates art, it's, it's, it's something that sits right in you concretely, meaning a black stroke is a black stroke. The feeling I have in my heart is the feeling I have in my heart. There's no question about it. It's not, it's as much as it's just a sensation and you think you could call it just a sensation, it's also the only thing that makes your life what it is, is having those sensations and feeling them. And in this case, you have an artist who's actually recording them. So Ideo Pantaleoni is the artist's name. And in uh, 1968, he painted this image called Ribbons. Um, it's interesting to note that he started to sign his name as Panta at a certain point, and I don't think it was only because he was tired of signing his name, but I think he started to brand himself very strongly uh, as Panta, uh, a little bit easier to say maybe, um, but it also sounds more concrete to me. It sounds like something of an anchor, so he doesn't have any question that who he was and what he painted were all the same thing, and that's what I think he's saying to us here. Um, if we consider... Moving along here a bit, I'd like to see what the next piece is. We've got this piece, whoa, <laughs> you're going to see, which is number eight if you call us in, and it's a really wild piece. This is going to be a, a, a big one to talk about, and I, I hope you all give me a ring. This is Experimentation 6, 1977. This is pretty late in his career, but about 10 years, no, we got about five, seven years before the piece we were just looking at. Now, what is this? Experimentation 6, 1977. It uses airbrush. He's also doing something very unusual, which is inscribing the canvas. He's cutting into the canvas. These lines aren't actually painted. They're carved out of the canvas. And if you look, this is 19 and a half inches by 27 inches. And that would be in centimeters uh, 50 by 70. Now, this piece is beautiful to me. This reminds me of, a, of a, a, like a diamond or a gemstone. If you look at the center of the piece, you've got this beautiful orange sort of glowing moment, right? And then you've got this wonderful sort of ring of black and then down into these glowing blues, right? All incredible moments of distillation, sort of pulling things together down to a very simple moment. And that's what he's done for us is, is sort of focused our energy in to a very discreet moment like a gemstone. Now, what's interesting to me is he does that here in the center of the painting. Then I have to wonder, why did he do this and why did he do this? What is he trying to say when he pulls those out like that? And I think, I would think it's kind of like communion or uh, community. You know, you have this isolated moment 
and then you have another moment and another moment. And they are separate from one another, although they're close to one another. They're not completely isolated, right? So he's pulling us in, and he's trying to give us an experience of community, of what it means to be together. Um, how he does that, I think, is interesting, is using this blue as well. He uses the blue to tie everything together. So he pulls this in, to this in, to this in, all sort of unifying these three separate entities all happening like stars. And if you zoom way in, let's zoom right into here. There's like a planet in here. If you come all the way in, you're going to see this incredible moment where you see just stars inside like a tiny little constellation in the middle of this universe where you have a fire on what could be the sun, but like a fire at the edges. You see a whole world inside that. And then outside of that, you come into this blackness, which is basically darkness and quiet. He cut it, okay? He cut this rectangle into it, this, uh, what's it, like a trapezoid. But um, he cut it in, and I keep thinking, why did he do that? If it's not there, it basically diffuses into nothingness. The painting feels like just drifting space. Uh, but with this, he sort of sets up what we'd call um, a very clear connection to the human body. So he actually connects us to something physical, something grounded, something very real. And that's what those, those incised moments do, is they re-anchor us. And you have to remember this artist, who is Ideo Pantaleoni, Panta, painting this painting in 1977, was actually obsessed his whole life. He was interested in the idea of things being concrete and really connected to what matters to us as humans, which is the experiences we have. You know, not just what we see, but what we feel and what we think. And so he went back over and over from the early 1950s. Uh, he was, he, well, earlier than that, actually, in the 30s, he was looking at geometrical abstraction, the avant-garde movements in Europe. He was studying in Milan uh, quite a bit. At that period, he was probably out of school uh, in the 30s. But he started looking at these uh, movimento arte concreta, the movement, the concrete art movement, and thinking about how do we record the experiences that we have. What's interesting also is as we moved through art history to the current moment we're in, uh, you know, the, around the year 2000, maybe 10, 2007, maybe 7 to 10, we started seeing something called provisional painting. Provisional painting uh, is a movement that's huge right now, which is that the artist basically is responsible for completing the work. I'm sorry, the artist, the viewer is responsible for completing the work. The viewer looks at the work and has to kind of put themselves into it to, to make sense of it. Um, it's not handed to you easily. Uh, works that were more like a portrait or of a still life where you see a bowl of fruit or a person may seem very exciting at some point, but then they stop. Uh, they're great records, I think, of what happens uh, historically, uh, but they're not the moment you're in. They're not talking about the experiences you're having now. And that's what I find he's doing in something like this, is he's talking to this concrete movement of getting something that's very immediate, very uh, uh, responsive to your, to your experience. But then, you know, with all the stuff we've said, you've got these, this, what I say is like a being with a body, another being and a body and a being and a body as a community, I think. What's it ultimately about? And that's where, again, it would be great to have your ideas of what you think is happening, uh, because I think art is a conversation. It's not just one person uh, talking to you, but it's, it's actually conversing. I can talk to myself. I can actually say that this, uh, for me, is about, I guess this would be me, because I know myself best, and uh, I am in the center of the painting, because I live in my body. Uh, I live near other people, and I'm getting to know them. Now, these are significantly different people. There's one that's sort of darker, calmer, one that's a little more lively and, and actually quite extreme. It's interesting that this dot is so much more aggressive than this dot, and it's because it's on a light background against dark, where this is on a dark background against dark. So it's a different type of person to me. You know, this person has some energy to them, some stability, but they're quieter. They're more uh, of an introspective person, more in interior. Um, I tend to be a, probably a balance between the two. There's some, some aggression and energy to what, what represents me um, and excitement, but also I can be quiet. I can, I can get to a place where you may not find it appropriate for TV, but you can actually see me sit contemplatively. I love nature. I love being out in the space, and actually this reminds me of nature. But if I go to the other person up above, the other, what I'm calling the other person, the other entity, um, it feels like they're far more energetic. You know, there's a lot going on. They're moving fast. They're uh, maybe a go-getter, you could say, somebody who's actually moving through life. So how do these three things exist with one another? I spoke earlier today on another show about Ideo Pantaloni, 
about Pantaleoni, <laughs> about uh, these spaces in the background, which we frequently ignore, they're actually things that, that anchor an image. This space over here and this space right up over here. They tend to, there's a little bit here, but it's, that's more embodied. These things are the nothingness. They're the negative. The, they tend to hold, these two tend to hold these three spaces together. Um, so those are the things in our lives that we don't really even see or know exist. Um, think of something like uh, if, you, if you go to an event with family, what are the things you don't notice? You notice the event, you notice the cake, you notice the food, you notice the people that are there, but do you remember the room? Do you remember, um, you know, people that didn't come to the party maybe? Did you remember things that you forgot or things that you left behind, you know, that you don't bring to the party? Like if you're at a party generally, we're celebrating, we're, we're you know, having a, a lot of excitement, you wouldn't really necessarily express the thing that was uh, a moment of struggle or, or, or tension at home or whatever you want to say. But those are the things that contain the other experiences. So here's a case where you have it in an image. You actually have pieces of of space that hold the rest of the image together. You see this? So this to me is a beautiful thing because it reminds me, hey, while I'm going through all these experiences in my life, I can kind of uh, remind, remember them, celebrate them, and hold them dear to me. I don't have to race by them. I don't have to ignore them, you know? Uh, I can take my time and spend a moment to understand them. Uh, experiencing our lives is one thing. Understanding it is a whole other. And I think if you come to an understanding, you come to a, a peace that we, I think, uh, some people will find in religion, some people will find it in spirituality, but it's some sense of, of meaning and well-being in our lives. And I think artwork is one of the most beautiful places where this happens for us, where we get a sense of being connected to our inside world, connecting to what we're experiencing in the outside world, and understanding it, creating these records helps us reflect on it later. And also, it helps us share it with others if we choose to. It's easier for someone to understand what's going on inside you if you can actually show them a work of art that moves you um, and expresses what's happening on an interior world. Does that make sense? Lastly, I want to say this painting, just to remind you, um, is a piece by the artist Ideo Pantaleoni. It's a little bit of a long name, but a, a wonderful name to say. I think you'll enjoy saying it. And the work is Experimentation 6. It was done in 1977. It is $6,600. It is airbrush on canvas with incised lines of white. It is 19 by 5 inches by 27 and a half inches. And that is 50 by 70 centimeters uh, if you're viewing uh, from a European audience. Now, I'd like to move over here a little bit and look at a painting that is may look significantly different than the last one, but I think also has interesting uh, connections to it. Uh, this piece was kind of floating and connecting here, right, in these boxes. This piece is kind of a, a, a swath through a village. Maybe I'm wondering, are we in Venice with quiet moorings? Looks like we're in Venice. Sure looks like Venice to me. Yeah, it is Venice. <laughs> so we're zooming through here, and then we have these concrete buildings, we have these concrete boats, so there's a great deal of stability and things kind of sticking around, but then there's this movement, this wonderful movement. Now, where does that movement come from? You gotta wonder, right? You look at the image, and I don't know right away where all that movement comes from. I think it's coming from some of the brush marks. Uh, I think it's coming from some of the light marks. You see all this? These little light moments in here? They're all over the painting, and they sort of dot through and hold the painting together. Now, remember I said that this painting Related to the one we saw just a minute ago, it's because of the solidity and the air that is in here, right? And that they hold each other. So it's a, a, a beautiful act on the part of the artist to connect the different pieces of himself. Uh, what I keep saying is he loved concrete art, right? The concrete movement was all the brush marks being formal, being strong. But then he also loved the informal, uh, which was about the brute kind of uh, gut of us, you know, the, the, the emotional side of us. And so when you look at this, you get the sense of things being sort of uh, a journey through this painting. So look, look here for a moment. Let's, let's come down off the village, and you see these little tiny brush marks and stuff, right? Look how these brush marks start to enlarge as you come down here. They get really big. They get almost an inch wide. Down at the bottom, they're almost two inches wide. He's got these huge marks. You also see a signature there from 1947. But this painting is moving you 
through the brush marks. He's taking you on a journey. Look at, look at how you're moving through this. It's sort of guiding you through this journey. And all of you have been on some journey in your life. I don't, I don't mind if the journey is uh, virtual or real, but you've been on an experience where you go from one place to another, and that's what he's showing you here. He's taking you on this world, and you wonder, why is he taking you through this whole thing? It seems to me that the answer rests in the center of this canvas. What is this? This is a building, right? Just windows, very unusually green with red. Um, you see the murk in the water is sort of this wonderful reflection of that building. What is that building? For this painting, to me, it's the, it's the heart of the painting. Uh, this is called quiet moorings. Quiet moorings, meaning the boats are moored, right, quietly. But it also looks to me like quiet morning. <laughs> it looks like some morning where you have this wonderful center held, and then as you pan out, you see this whole painting, that this is like the heart of the painting. This is a moment where I'm able to rest, and there's things that support this, like the green water, you know, shadows, the green tree up here that hold it together. And well, again, why does an artist do something like this? Why do we need something like this? I need to feel my feet under my, you know, body. I need to feel a sense of grounding. I need to feel a sense of safety as I move through all the adventures in my life. And he probably is leaving this behind for us to say, hey, I get you, buddy. You know, I know what you need, and I know how you feel, that you need a, a, a little bit of a, a mooring. He's giving us a quiet mooring, which is also interesting to me, because it's not, it's not noisy, it's not tied to a pole and, and made to... Um, to, to, uh, you know, to keep it from going out to sea or anything. This is something where the boats are resting. The boats are you know, taking a little trip around here and they're resting next to the, next to the, the street uh, or the sidewalk, but they're held in here and they're gently held in here, um, all for the express purpose of going home maybe to this, this heartbeat in the center. So this is a, a, a very steady piece. This isn't a... Um, you know, I, I think we're moving towards some pieces that are going to get pretty crazy. Um, uh, yeah, we've got some crazy things coming up. I want to have a stop into one here, and then I'll, then I'll take you on a, a journey. But um, it's interesting. This piece is in his whole history. This is 1947, so he's a pretty young fellow. Remember, he was born in 04, so this puts him at, what, 43? Yeah, and he lived to 78, so we're almost, oh no, he lived into his 80s, yeah. So we still got time, but uh, <laughs> he's a pretty young fellow, and I feel it's, it's interesting, this piece to me, um, he did a lot of energetic works. He had a lot of fire in him, and this piece is very calm. It's, although it's got a lot of energetic strokes and stuff, overall it's a very calm piece. When you back out all the way, you look at this whole thing, it's not crazy. Um, it's a it's a, an emotionally deep piece, but it's visually very calming to me. Uh, it doesn't wrestle with me, doesn't make me feel crazy. It's, it's very calm and holds you together. And I think it's great to have an anchor like that. Again, you're watching LiveArtTV dot, at LiveArtTV.com. And uh, you can see us streaming live on Roku, Android, Apple, Amazon Fire Stick, and YouTube. You can call us also at 855-983. 5483. I look forward to hearing from you. We're going to start kind of heading around the corner here. I'd like to see a couple pieces over here. Um, this is an interesting piece. Uh, heading this way. If you look at this right here, this is called Still Life with Blue Glass Carafe. Um, it's an oil on canvas, it's 23 and a half inches by 19 and a half inches. It is 60 by 50 centimeters if, if you're coming in from Europe. And it is $8,600. This piece, let's take a little bit of a journey through this piece, if you don't mind. Um, consider what you're looking at. This is a very strong element. Why is that there? Obviously, it's the table, right? I get that. But what does it mean, or what does it do for me? I think it holds this whole world together, right? And then, then you think, well, why not flood the whole painting with it? Imagine taking that out. What if the painting was just this? It's a little oppressive. It's a little too much for me. If I put that bar in, in the background, it gives me a break, and I can back out a little bit. So we're taken on a journey you know, through all this activity, and then we back out, and we see this bar holds this whole thing together. So there's some breathing space. 
around this room, right? If we go from piece to piece to part to part, we can take a journey, you know, you enter this painting here and you come up through the fruit, right? You come up through these three fruit, again, you're sitting potentially having a snack uh, at lunchtime, you're eating some fruit, drinking some wine, and you're taking a look here together. It seems like a pretty quiet place. This is actually a nice moment. I think we were just in 1947, yeah, looking at the, um, the boats in Venice and the moorings. And now look at this in comparison to that. You can see how he's using purple here. Remember he used green in the last painting to anchor the painting? Here he's using a purplish kind of blue to anchor these fruit and drop them down. But it's, it's different than the last painting. I would say that the brush marks here are a little quieter. They're a little more unified, pulled together. And so things are a little calmer. This is a moment to sit, for, for my money, it's about sitting alone and being a little bit uh, more internal. When you look at this work, it's like a meditation or a, a um, how would you speak of it? Uh, not an isolation. Uh, yeah, meditation is a beautiful word, actually. It's sitting alone, quiet with yourself for a second, taking a break. And it's restful. There's no anxiety here. You think about this artist. This artist had a huge career that spanned almost six decades. Uh, and he showed in many uh, biennials, he showed in the Triennial in Milan uh, back in 1954. There was an interesting experience, which is almost to the, the antithesis of this. It was called the Casa Sperimentale B24, which is this wild exper uh, experimental experience about um, not making artwork as much as having like live performances and live events happening that were recorded. Now, he did that in his artwork, because if you look closely in here, look at all these marks. You can see every mark makes a set of grapes, but the marks themselves are an event. They're exciting to look at. You know, you're taking a bit of a ride around this image. Look at the wonderful geometries and calligraphy of those marks right there, right? So he, he's taking you into his life a little bit. He's not just creating a photograph or a photographic image of fruit. He's taking you on a journey, and this was important to him. We've spoken a little bit about the concrete art uh, that he was interested in and what that meant. Originally, remember, concrete art was about an abstract geometry. So it's taking the brush marks and making them very um, much so what the painting is about. That's not the case here. He's taking brush marks here and talking about fruit and making glasses and vases and things, right? So it's not necessarily the concrete art, but then how does it relate to the concrete art? Because he was so interested in concrete art that you think it has to influence these works, and it does influence these works. Because when you look at these works, take this one right here is, is spectacular. This is an amazing piece of fruit. <laughs> Wait till you get in here. This, I mean, it's like a world. I mean, it almost looks like a panda bear's face upside down. If you turn it upside down, there's the nose and the eyes. But um, it's crazy alive. There's beautiful brushwork in here, crazy amounts of, uh, of texture. Uh, there's a color here that's like a gray, red, kind of um, like a putty. And then if you, you may not even notice it at first, but there's this wonderful stroke of green across the bottom. And it's floating. Green is the opposite color to this red up in here. And this red, although it's fiery at times, it also becomes almost like a blood, like a heart. You know, this whole thing being a heart. So you think this is, to me, this is the heart of the painting. This is this strange little thing that's right up at the front of the painting. It rests at the bottom and it's closest to us. And this is him doing what we call art concrete. Although he's painting a piece of fruit, which is more evident here, I think, here he breaks down the fruit to become this experience. You don't even know what you're looking at. I would, I would guess I'm looking at a pomegranate, something that's been cut open, and I can see the insides. But what is he, why does he do that, right? I said that he wants us to experience it, but what does he want us to experience? The insides of life, you know, cut something open and get down to the core of it. What is he saying about it? Um, there's a fair amount of liveliness. Uh, it's quite beautiful to me, but it's also difficult, dangerous, you know, it's something of a dare, it's something of the struggles we experience in life, and to me, they're all resting on this blue again, so he, he puts them in a place where they're grounded, and the blue actually surrounds most of them, so it's holding them, keeping them safe. He's not tearing us apart, he's actually telling us, look, it can be difficult, but it's contained, and you'll be safe, um, and then when you come out of that experience, he still holds you on this plate, uh, he offers you some, some company, but it's, it's contained again, remember? We have this huge background table shape, but I think it's less important that it's a table and more that it holds all of this together. How does he hold us together? Look at the brush marks. Look how he, he moves us around, right? It's almost like uh, 
like he's hugging us. <laughs> I mean, he's holding you and wrapping around you, and it, and, and it contains you. So you're, you're not out of control. Even though there's a lot of activity and a lot of energy and life in this image, he's not beating you up. He's saying to you, it's all right. Take a break, you know. Calm down. In all that life, there's moments where you get to rest. And I think about, I mean, I, I, loved eating, uh, I loved eating this kind of lunch with my grandmother, actually. She's Italian, just like him. And she'd sit down with me, and she'd prepare us these lunches that were more about the ceremony than the food. It was about sitting down with each other and uh, having a moment that you remember together. Uh, hers would have octopus in it, but here we have, <laughs> we have some fruit and wine, and it's a light you know, snack. Uh, something to keep you going so that you don't have to, to be alone in the day. But it, it did strike me when I first saw this painting, I was struck by the fact that it's sitting there alone um, <clears throat> in this room, but it feels like <clears throat> maybe two of us are on this side of the painting. I don't feel there's a person in the painting. I feel like it's us on the edge. Uh, and I do feel like I have company. I do feel like I'm, I'm protected here. So well, let's head this way a bit. Um, we may go down quite a ways. Uh, actually, yeah. We're going to go all the way over, and I want to come back to some of these pieces potentially, but we might be coming all the way over here. How do you feel about that? Do you want to join me soon? Uh, yeah. <laughs> we'll take a little ride. I think this piece. I want to take a view of it. Um, we're heading into some crazy land, so hang on and uh, be patient with me. This is a piece called When We Get It. I'll tell you what it's called, actually. It's the dinner party. It's from 1977. And there it is. Woo! This is a heck of a piece. This is a piece. It's the dinner party, 1977. 20.5 inches by 29 and a half inches. It is airbrush on canvas. It is 60 by 90 inches if you're a European audience. And it's $6,600. You're watching live art TV. So let's look at some live art. This piece is almost like a meal. Yeah. You know, you've got these plates. <laughs> you've got the fruit and food. But where are we? We're totally out of the image. We're floating above it. This is just like a dream. You're sitting up in the air, and you're rising above it and looking down on it. Now, why, again, would an artist paint something like this? Why would they paint something that is a complete idea? You know, it's not even uh, uh, even close to a reality. It's just a mentality. And you have this mentality about what? This crazy meal. What happened at this meal? Who interacted with who? Now, there's an interesting thing. If you look at the blue here, it goes to blue. So you move from one blue to another. This green thing, you move to the green here. So your mind automatically connects things that are similar. Even though this is red and this is purple and purple, they are similar to each other that our mind sort of moves between them. And even purple is related to blue, so sometimes your mind will move between those three. The one thing that stands out, which is crazy, is this yellow. What is this yellow? Why, why is it there and does it, does it work for you? I think it works brilliantly, and I'll tell you why. There's yellow and there's orange. Now those are standout colors and especially this yellow. And I think, why? What does, why is something in the top of a painting like that is that it's generally it's important. Something the center of a painting is the most important. Up high is very important. You think, why is that there? And to me, it's kind of like a, the, the thing everything hangs off of, like the center point. So weirdly enough, this isn't the top of the painting. Believe it or not, the top of the painting is out here because we're looking down on the painting. Instead of looking into a landscape or a, or a still life like we were on the last painting, we're looking from above. So actually, this isn't the top. This is kind of to the side. And if that's to the side, then this is to the side. And those two sort of balance all of this craziness out. Woo! There's a lot of activity in here. And then we have these anchors that sit to the sides. This is a little bit of an anchor, too. So could that be, but softer, much more subtle. This one is a severe anchor, and there's nothing like it. There's nothing like that circle. There's nothing like that, that hard edge there that you see between the yellow and the, the whitish gray background. So this is, this is a very unusual piece. Um, it's hard to, to grasp it all, but it's this crazy lunch. It's kind of a Mad Hatter, Alice in Wonderland lunch. And then, again, remember? What are we ignoring? All this gray. What are we not looking at? All this gray. What does that gray do? Now, I'll, there's a special kind of uh, magic here. Gray is not a color. Gray is what we call a tone or an achromatic situation. Achroma means black and white gray. We don't have a hue in it. 
you don't see red, orange, yellow, green, blue, or violet in it. But all colors come from, uh, basically, when they come together, they create gray. So they drop down and create this gray. So the gray is a piece of all the colors, but it's a combination of all the colors. If the colors are in perfect balance with one another, it's something called spectral completion, where all the spectral colors come together and create a feeling of grayness. So grayness is almost like nothingness. It's, like a, it's a spatial nothingness. It's not white. White tends to jump forward. Black, which we don't have here, would drop way back. And then this gray sort of floats. So why is the gray there? Why did he spray this paint on and let it float around like that? I would say it's because he has so much activity in the colors. You're jumping from green to green, from blue to blue, the balance of the yellow and the orange against one another, all the violets and reds sort of bouncing. You know, it's this crazy Mad Hatter meal. And then you have these huge gray rings, this rectangle. Everything's sort of sitting there that calms the whole image down, takes it down a notch, and lets you rest while all this activity is going on. Now, what kind of lunch is this? I said that the last lunch was more of a lunch with my grandmother. This lunch is on a spaceship. I feel like I'm, <laughs> I'm eating on a different planet, and I don't even know where I am or why I'm there. And uh, it's all about adventure. Uh, I get excited when I see this because this is just a weird painting. And this is his ovier. He always wanted us to have experiences. And, and this experience, I said at the beginning, this is more of a mental experience. It's something that I can't imagine. Well, I've never been on a spaceship. I'm probably not going to be on a spaceship. And when I look at this, I get to imagine, well, here's spaceship lunch. You know, it's a pretty good place to be. If somebody was future thinking and not really interested in the physical world they're living in, or say you just want to escape for a while, this is a great place to go. I think that lunch on the spaceship, and I don't even remember, here we are. <laughs> lunch on a spaceship is called the dinner party. I would like to go to this dinner party, definitely. The painting, again, is airbrush on canvas. If you're just tuning in, it's 20 and a half inches by 29 and a half inches. It is 60 by 90 centimeters, and it is $6,600. This is a, a, a wonderful adventure to take, and I look forward to going on it with you. I would like to turn a corner. All right. Well, where are we going? Right over here. Okay. Just a little bit. And how are we doing on the... Oh, okay. Right. I'm going to say that again, because this is a pretty big piece. You have to see it. 31 and a half inches. That's pretty large. And it's 39 and a half inches high. In centimeters, that's going to be 80 by 100 centimeters. 80 by 100 centimeters. And we look at this. Uh, this is a later piece in his life. I believe we're in the 80s, 81. We are, 1981. And it's $8,600. You're watching LiveArtTV.com. So make sure you check the website to see the whole collection. But also stay in touch with us. If you want to contact us, call 855 9 Eight three five four eight three, and drop me a line. I'd love to talk to you. If you're out there, say hi and tell me what you think of this work. I want to have a conversation with you about what you're seeing, what you're excited about. These are beautiful works to see live. They're more of an experience for me than they are uh, an image of art. Uh, you feel them in your body, and this piece especially so. Of, 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 of many of the pieces, this is a, one of the liveliest I've seen, and I think if you need a kick, this is it. This piece explodes from the bottom. I mean, it's unbelievable what happens. Um, it, it, it's hard to even contain it. It's in, it. It just keeps exploding at all different levels. It comes up through here, and then the background is just in pieces. There's almost nothing held together anymore. I'm going to jump to the other side so I can talk to you. But if you look, if you look up in here and work backwards, imagine, imagine all this has already exploded. It's already you know, out there. It's, it's, it's a massive, I mean, it's hard to explain. This must be somebody's uh, wedding day because this is an explosive experience. Uh, these pools that li live in the background are so calm, you can hardly see them. They're kind of way over there, whereas all this is happening to you in the front and you're going through. When you come down into it, you almost, you almost can make out like a, a flower here. It almost feels like um, what do you call that? Who is that? Transformers. It almost feels like transformers transforming into something, but they're coming back down through and sort of forming in here. It's becoming whole in some way. I don't, I don't quite know what's forming, but it's, it's like a bouquet. Um, I, guess, I guess when the marriage is, the wedding day is over, you actually fall into being married and uh, have to live a life. And this is, this is the life amongst your peers. These are all the people in your life, your family members, the things that are going on. Now, I, uh, this is one side of the story. We, I'm going to still stick with this for a minute because I want to talk about what this can potentially be. But then I want to go another route. We'll talk about 
uh, it from more of a formal artistic aspect. But right now, let's look at what it is. It is this kind of field uh, with this activity happening in it, uh, a bit of a dance, an explosion of flowers, a life. Um, it's funny. I feel like something's being built in this painting. Uh, as much as it explodes and loses itself at times, right down here, it's very methodical how it forms. And then it, these pieces, uh, the, the orange shapes are actually fitting into the purple shapes. It's not like they're separate, like the purple's a background and the orange is a foreground. It's more like they're one in the same. And this is, this is something interesting that we saw in his work earlier, where he establishes flat environments and then creates space that moves th through uh, three-dimensional space. Here it feels like he's almost creating the two simultaneously. There's a, a space is alluded to, but the image is very flat down here. You find that you're kind of right on the surface and you're connecting to it. Now, what that does to us internally is it feels like... Um, it feels like it's a pause. It's a place where you stop, and it's, it's surprising to think of an image like this having a pause in it, because as you come up, it, it explodes. Now, that's what allows the explosion to be more powerful up here, is the column in places like this, where you start out and then you go. Uh, once it explodes, it's a full-on. Now, what's, what's interesting to me is this is one of the most seemingly explosive areas. It kind of jumps out of the painting, but it doesn't jump that much. It actually feels like a tower in the distance. It feels like it kind of calms down, actually. And what, the reason that is, is remember I said in the last image, we were looking at the galactic space dinner? That was red connected to red, blue connects to blue. This is orange connecting to orange. So it stays kind of calm. You know, you can, you can dot between them where you see a little bit of a contrast. Orange is a light color, unlike blue, which is dark. So orange and white are like each other. And so although this is a lot, it kind of stays together. And when you move to the right, you start to see these wonderful sort of light areas. They're light on light, light blue, light yellow, light pink, and it's kind of calm. It's actually not too crazy for all the activity that's happening over there, and there is quite a bit of activity. It's quiet. It's kind of a, a resolve. Um, then when you come down, as we're drifting, we come down into this excitement, the people, the moments of our lives, right? They're floating over here. They're significantly separate from the orange. That's very different than what we find here, remember? This is all sort of knitted together. I think we all know that experience. This is, a, this is an incredible piece. This piece you could look at all day. There's so many activities in here that remind me of life, about going to college and getting married and, and uh, taking vacations uh, to, to national parks in the West and seeing all these, these places. This is an unbelievable piece for me um, that I can't stop. This is, uh, remember, you're looking at Adeo Pantaleoni. Uh, this painting was in 1981, towards the end of his career. Uh, it's a culmination of all that he was. Uh, it really is a spectacular piece. Um, I, 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 it bears um, seeing it in person to experience it, to understand what it's doing, because it's, it's like a lifetime. You, you feel so many different experiences in it and so many things that are not just emotional and, and physical, like the reality you live, the, you know, the dinner parties you go to, the... the um, weddings that you've attended, but it's also the internal emotional world that we lived. It's the places that we've gone and what we felt. Uh, it really uh, is a spectacular piece. You have to see it live. I highly recommend you get a hold of it and take a look at it because it it'll give you something to cherish for years. Beautiful piece. This is, again, uh, Ideo Pantaleoni's Tectonic Plates. It's an oil on canvas, 31 and a half inches by 39 and a half inches. It is $8,600, and it's for sale right now. So I would take a look at it at livearttv.com and take a view. Thank you so much for your time. If you want to ask me any questions, feel free to give me a call, 855-983-5483. Thank you for your time. See you again. Bye.